Welcome to our webinar podcast on test room requirements engineering TDRE, part three, practice of TDRE. My name is Christoph Ebert. I'm the managing director of Vector Consulting Services, and I will guide you through this webinar. Test room requirements engineering had been introduced or in part one, which was about the motivation. We remember that it gives us a big boost by improving the testability bring the tester earlier in the picture, ensuring that we have uh, more precise requirements that we avoid the typical uh, pitfalls and that we can achieve savings of up to 30% because of less rework. In the foundations, which were presented in the second part of this webinar, we had looked into the specific topics such as a template structure for testable requirement but also the triple peak, which uh, shows the connection of requirements, solution development, and testing, where we have this forward branch to connect the requirement of the test case, but also the backward branch to improve the solution or the requirement depending on the test result. This time, we will show from our many industry case study what it really means. So an um, important aspect is, of course, the process of our requirements engineering. We want to improve requirements quality. That means to evaluate the priorities and the value of each requirement. This is something which we have to do in the very beginning. Why is it connected to test? Because certainly we want to make sure that the requirement later on is really in the format which we can also deliver as a product. The Kano model helps us to distinguish in a triage between base performance and excitement factors. Of course, we strive for the latter two because the base factors would not really be paid for. It means also that we make formal checks. That's verification, doing things right. Verification, use checklists, use reviews that we, for instance, follow templates like the one which we introduced in part two of this webinar and uh, also that we perform a specific analysis, such as is the requirement comprehensible, such as average sentence length, et cetera. And we want to validate the requirement. Validation means doing the right thing, which is we compare the requirements versus the real needs. And we want to avoid that we specify maybe only a sunny day scenario. We have to look into correlations we have to look into misuse scenarios, such as uh, cybersecurity attacks, abuse scenarios, confused scenarios, such as a uh, wrong user experience, and also ensure that we test these kinds of negative requirements. And that means also that we need appropriate tool support. I mentioned already in the previous two webinars on uh, test driven requirements engineering, that we certainly have to connect with our requirements tool and the testing. That means our test database, our requirements database, they should somehow connect. This can be achieved with traceability, but also if we can simply use one single database. In this database, we can have the requirement as a test case, same as we do in TDD, test room development, or we can have uh, separate perspectives. One is the requirement, one is the test cases, but in the same tools allows us to have notification if one of the two are changing, then we keep the requirements and the test cases and hopefully all the other generated artifacts for documentation, um, user guide, etc. consistent. So here's a view to an ALM solution, which has the requirements, the dependencies of the requirements. It also has uh, the viewpoint in terms of a requirements template with priorities, effort estimation, etc., and ensures that we have symmetry between the requirement. This is the, for instance, endorse uh, short specified need. We have the design, which would then be the solution part, and we have the test, which is the uh, test database, the test management. Within a single source, it will ensure also that we have consistency Key question in testing is always the coverage. 
Test-driven requirements engineering improves test coverage because literally speaking, we have not a single requirement without at least a single test case. So there must be a one-to-one -one relationship from requirement to test case. Initially, later on, we realize some test cases in specific correlation might have to be added. So that, for instance, we have um, functionality which we specify straightforward, and then we reflect, well, it could be misused, abused. So we might have two negative requirements for cybersecurity. And the same can, of course, also happen if this functionally correlates with another one. For instance, if you have services, often they correlate with the billing uh, related uh, functionality. And that means we would finally end up having an N to M relationship. N, which would be requirements, correlate and are adjusted with M test cases. This M to M relationship is quite normal in test and it means that we have still the coverage, but it's not as trivial as simply saying each requirement has that one single test case. Now, what it means with the coverage is that we have a progress. We have a definition of done. This definition of done is very important. It's not just an agile slogan. It's something which I've seen in many current projects as the key anchor point for building a good and trustworthy partnership between the customer and the supplier. Often, we have misunderstandings in what is the definition of done. We deliver something, the customer would say, but that's missing this, is missing that. This is what we want to avoid. And for that reason, we better think twice and make the requirement testable, have a clear definition of done. And that means also that we have this binary decision, how far are we in the project? Often we are subject to what we call the 90% complete syndrome. That is, people would claim 90% of the time that they are 90% ready. And that happens typically after week one, because we have a feeling, well, we have understood everything, even if we have not understood everything. And from here onwards, it can drag on months where we struggle to really get things done. That means we need a binary decision which requirements have already been implemented. And this is important to have the progress. It's important because many customers pay just uh, based on progress. Now, an organization challenge which we often face in our project is to make the testers available for requirements engineering. That means we have to plan accordingly because typically if you have two simple projects like in the picture here project one is still running when project two is starting how do we get a tester from one to the other project well obviously it means we have to foresee it we have to make very sure if we don't have that tester we have much more rework later on that is we have to plan x percent my recommendation would be 20 percent of the time of the tester which goes into the testability and the requirements reviews and that still leaves uh, four days a week for testing, but it would be one, week, one day per week for the requirements engineering. Another challenge in the organization is that with uh, especially agile teams, the teams are small, they are self-reliant, they're feature-driven, and uh, suddenly we have to ensure that very different um, competences would be accessible, safety, cybersecurity, systems engineering, maybe specific software expertise, that means also the system engineer, the requirements expert would be in a hierarchic scrum or scrum team, but then also work with their own counterparts on the implementation level. So each one of these teams should also have a systems engineer, at least somebody who can be reached on systems engineering in order so that we can really deliver later on in the team also value without continuous structure a struggle how do I get access uh, to the other uh, people I need? Let's look to an hands-on example, TDRE for a critical safety critical system. It's a passenger elevator, which has a cable parking brake, very standard uh, solution. The critical use case would be what's the function and this function would then also drive our test case. Then we ask ourselves, so how can this function be not working? What would be the malfunctions? This can be done with a hazard analysis, which we know from functional safety, but it can also be done by misuse cases, uh, such as we know from cybersecurity. How can it be exploited, misused? This gives us additional test cases. 
then we have to, of course, prioritize. Is it critical if this malfunction happens or not? If it's a critical one, something like we cannot control and it has a big impact, then we have to put this uh, test case on a high priority. Then there's a protection target. What must the missing product requirement looks like? That means it could be that the specific cabin which we talk here about is adequately uh, is secured. We can have to test, check that. And finally, um, what is the implementation perspective? If we are on an abstract level requirement and test case, we go down to the implementation. Do we have some structure identity which allows easier traceability? That would be, in this example, uh, the implementation of the safety level. So all that is part of uh, the uh, understanding of test-oriented and test-driven requirements engineering. Let us do a small benchmark to have a more practical look to it. We see both in IT, automotive, and other domains that this test-driven requirements engineering is increasingly necessary and also applied. We work on several projects currently. For instance, we can easily construct um, in cybersecurity uh, security test strategies and uh, adjust the pen testing. We can use it in traceability uh, for multivariant and multiversion systems. So there's a big benefit from this continuous software test based on a, a let's say, low-level unit test case with the respective the source code development on the higher level, the test driven requirements ensuring with the test cases and the requirements which fuel each other. Now that means the connection can also be done, uh, for instance, for the sake of safety and cybersecurity. Here we have in blue the security activities, red the safety activities. We can see two things. One, they are quite symmetric, so we can simplify. Second, that's most important on these horizontal layers, which we use typically in order to show continuous X, such as the bottom layer, which is continuous code, then a continuous build, and uh, finally, really continuous product in case of requirement changes. We use the symmetry to align also our quality requirements, the safety, the test requirement, the safety and the security requirements with the evolving structure. And that means. Also here, safety circuitry must be integrated in the HL development, and that's not a big problem. We also have the needs readily available. The message is that we test the unknown unknowns, and that means in terms of preparation, requirements engineering, we have to go from safe known states into unknown states, and then move into the unknown territory in order to really see the weakness. What we know, for instance, uh, in many of these examples would be that often the real challenges are not even available because we expect our system would somehow help themselves. But uh, to give you a short example, uh, let us look to this um, uh, autonomous vehicle. Uh, we see an accident. Uh, the uh, bicycle driver was uh, far late uh, seen. But if you really look to the driver, what we also see is that this driver is not even paying attention. He sees the driver far too late. He's playing on his uh, smartphone. And that's the biggest issue uh, that he would not really observe the street well enough. And this is what we have to be careful that we have not only to take assumptions on sunny day, but also on misuse, on abuse. The guy clearly had an abuse situation. He was asked by the car to always pay attention to the road. But as we know from autonomous vehicle, people love automatic vehicles because they can immediately, even on uh, low automation, they start to play with their gadgets, uh, do their uh, WhatsApp and social network uh, interfacing. But of course, it's a very high risk. And for that reason, the initial statement would be, don't even think about uh, too much of the complexity. Try first of all to understand the requirements and how they can be misused or misinterpreted. One example which I want to highlight is a, a, a project which we did with an automotive OEM, where we introduced an HR scaling with different dimensions. But a key dimension was our test requirements engineering, which helped us uh, to connect the requirements with a design for X and a real increasingly reusable platform and modeling. 
it's a big project uh, spanning several locations, but it's also one where it can really make lasting changes. So to summarize requirements, engineering needs test and vice versa. Test needs requirements, requirements needs test. Reviews by testers improve the quality should be always looked for because the tester is negative, and I mean that in a positive sense, he detects the defects. He looks for a definition of done, he looks for completeness. Black box test cases must always be designed at the start of the project, we should not wait to the end because then we know about the implementation, we might not anymore have this innocent black box perspective. Thirdly, black box uh, help to improve the quality and thus the project result because we ask ourselves early what would happen, what are the external constraints, etc. And we have realized that we can save on effort by 30%. There's some YouTube uh, videos in our uh, lineup uh, for uh, consulting topics uh, about requirements engineering, also about TDRE, which is now including this one would be the three of them. We have templates which you can download. We have a media center with a lot of articles and we have um, the requirements engineering support, which you can always ask for. And we have, of course, a lot of literature which help us also to grow with our requirements engineering. And with that, let me summarize from the three parts on test room requirements engineering. We have been motivated for it because we actually improve and streamline the requirements engineering and test. We ensure that we have the test cases early. We have a look into making our requirements testable. In doing so, we will reduce the rework and then of course also would have possibility to deliver other topics, which is of course much more efficient. In the second part, we looked into templates for testing. We looked also into how the uh, triple peak model is used as a foundation of requirements driven uh, testing. And we then would be also be uh, looking into the third part with tool support, organization topics, how to use uh, this uh, test driven requirements engineering in agile uh, teams, et cetera, so that we can uh, seamlessly use this also in our own project. And this is what I recommend to you. Start writing your test cases in a way that they can substitute requirements or vice versa. You can also make, let's say, two columns in your requirements database, one for the requirement, one for the test case. If you don't want to make a simple cut and paste exercise, that's fine. Just don't create overhead. And that brings me to the end. Stay tuned to our series, but also uh, to your own success. Ensure that you deliver the success. And if you want to learn more, join us at Twitter, at VectorVCS, or simply online with the uh, vector.com slash consulting, et cetera. I thank you and wish you good success. Bye.